My name is Tom Borneman. I'm the director of the mental health program here at the Carter Center, and welcome to all of you. And thank you for sharing your time and your energies with us uh, for our 29th annual Rosalind Carter Symposium on Mental Health Policy. 29 years, it's hard to believe. Uh, and we actually have some veterans here who have attended a good percentage of those 29. Uh, next year is going to be our 30th, and we're going to have to think about something really good for that one. Uh, it's a time to, to celebrate, maybe reminisce, talk about where we've come from, where we're going to. Uh, we are in one of the most dynamic periods in health in the United States ever. Remarkable time in, in, in our history as a nation. And we got to get it right. And that's what we're here to talk about these next day and a half. So welcome, and uh, we look forward to your participation and collaboration. Before I introduce my boss, um, I've got a few housekeeping uh, things that I'm required to go through for you. This event is being filmed by the Carter Center for future use in internal materials, as well as being webcast on our website. If you would rather not be filmed, you are welcome to sit up in the balcony. There are also media present covering the symposium. Uh, the working groups will be off the record, though. Please join in our discussion online as well by following us on Twitter using the hashtag CarterMH13. I have no idea in the world what that means, uh, but my younger staff assure me that it's accurate. So for those of you who are similarly challenged, just find one of the young folks and they'll, they'll explain it to you. Uh, there are taxi slips available at the registration desk with Susan Hunziker from our program. If you need to leave at any time during the symposium, you may turn the slip in at the re uh, reception desk here, right out the door, and a cab will be called for you. There are several Carter Center staff and volunteers in the lobby at all times to answer any questions you may have. We are running on a tight schedule, all joking aside. Uh, it, the food and beverages are allowed in here. Let me repeat that. Food and beverages are allowed so that when you go come back from a break, please come back in a timely manner so we can get going and not short-circuit short any of our panels. Our survey is online again this year, and we are asking that everyone fill it out during the symposium itself, either before you leave or shortly thereafter. There is a sheet on your tables with the web ad address. We actually really use these things, so I appreciate everybody for taking a few minutes to fill out the surveys. We have the same format on question and answer session as we did in previous years. Uh, rather than an open microphone Q&A, we're going to do them on index cards. Uh, there are uh, two in your packet already, and if you need more, our staff will be uh, moving around in between the, the tables, and you can get more um, cards. Staff will also be uh, available to you if you have any questions. Just write your question on the card in, in, about, in about 15 minutes before the Q&A portion of each panel. We will have staff and interns walk through the chapel, including the balcony, to collect them. At this point, that's all my housekeeping, so I can uh, uh, tell Lee that I did my duty, Lee, so you don't have to chide me anymore. Um, I, I get the distinct pleasure of introducing our leader and inspiration of the Carter Center, Mrs. Rosalind Carter. Mrs. Carter, please join us. Thank you, Tom, and good afternoon, and welcome to the Carter Center on an exciting, exciting day in the Carter family. Um, this morning, my grandson announced that he was going to run for governor of Georgia. And he knew he would, we knew he was going to do it, but we didn't know he was going to do it this morning. <laughs> and so I, I had a lot of excitement this morning anyway. And I'm not talking politics, but his grandmother. I know you can be sure that I'm very proud. And his mother's here with us today, too. Um, she, helped, she has helped me so much when Jimmy was 
uh, governor and president, and it's good to have her with me today. Um, well, today our program is about the Affordable Care Act. <clears throat> it's written it, and it was really the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act of 2010. And working in concert with the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, a lot of words, of 2008, for the first time guaranteed all Americans access to a comprehensive and modern set of behavioral health care benefits. In other words, it provides mental health and substance use uh, coverage in its basic health package, which was exciting to all of As the law is being implemented, however, some problems, <laughs> shall I call them challenges, have arisen. But it still holds tremendous promise for us, ensuring improved health outcomes for our country. In 2008, Sweden had finally passed the Paul Wellstone Pete, the miniature parity bill, um, which was a major milestone, and all of us um, were excited about it. And the mental health office was in touch with Patrick Kennedy's office all the time. Um, they kept us, um, uh, let, they kept letting us know what was going on and we were helping all we could. I testified before Congressional Committee, and we celebrated when it was passed. It was such so exciting. I came back um, to the Carter Center, and the, my whole office, I think the whole Carter Center was down there uh, welcoming me back from that um, passage when I had, had gone to, to well, the next time I came in, just the, day, the next day. Um, but we had a big celebration. So, But looking back, it reminds me of when we got the 1980 Mental Health Systems Act passed. Um, it was about a month before, passed about a month before um, the election when, as Jimmy says, he was voluntarily in, retired from the presidency. And um, the incoming president put our legislation on a shelf, and it was never implemented. And that was one of the greatest disappointments of my life. It still is. But to get back to the subject, the final regulations for the Parity Bill have never been established, um, which has been a disappointment. I think the reason, though, was because the White House was always planning to um, include it in health care reform, um, the Affordable Care Act. So we've had two big victories, national health care reform and parity, yet the reality is that many, many still do not get um, coverage for mental um, health issues or for substance use conditions. Um, in the first place, the parrot, parrot is being implemented in some places, but with no final regulation, regulations, it's very difficult to know what is included and what is not. But also large employers who self-insure are not required to provide equal coverage. So the act never included coverage for everyone. I hope our next speaker can tell me that's not true, but I think it is. Uh, and there are stories coming out from various states that insurance providers are looking for ways to circumvent the spirit of the parity legislation. And this worries me, because under the law, states are making some of the major decisions about what's going to be covered and how it's going to be covered, and can be a lot of variation. So we in the mental health field need to keep tabs on how um, the law is be impl being implemented across the country so that parity for behavioral health is included in this essential so that we're sure that parity is included. Um, well, the promise of universal health care has been around since uh, Teddy Roosevelt and Jimmy even had uh, developed legislation uh, for health coverage when he was president. It was simple. He just expanded Medicare um, for everyone over a period of time, beginning with children and increasing in, 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 uh, at intervals. And he had the money in the budget for it. But the legislation was never passed, which is another story that I don't think I ought to tell right here. <laughs> <clears throat> well, it seems like I've been reminiscing this afternoon, but I think I've been around a long time. I can, I can do that with them. Um, well, while imperfect, the Affordable Care Act is one of the most advanced public policy achievements yet in move, moving us toward the goal of access to health care for all Americans. While there are many unknowns associated with the legislation, it is a significant step forward in the integration of behavioral health care and general medical care. Well, to start us off with our discussion this afternoon, um, we're pleased to have Dr. Stephen Sharpstein.
to provide us with some historical context. And um, his, his full biography is in your packet, so I'm not going to um, tell you everything about him, which is there's an awful lot that, that uh, he's done in the mental health field. But I thought I would, I just wanted to tell you a few things. He's been in, he's really qualified because he's been in the field for a very long time. Um, working to help those living with mental illness. He was one of my best friends and co-workers um, when Jimmy was president, serving on the President's Commission. Well, he didn't serve on the President's Commission, but he was there. He was assigned to the President's Commission, right? Um, and he was there all the time. And then in the end, when we were trying to get it implemented, he was the one who was going back and forth and back and forth, um, meeting with congressional people. Um, I remember, and I remember the day we got the legislation passed, we celebrated that. Uh, we, were, we had just a small group that had really worked so hard in, in working to get the information we wanted into the bill, then developing the legislation, and then getting it passed. So we had a celebration for this small group in the solarium at the White House, and Steve was one of them. Kathy Cade, who's here today, was one of those two. And Tom Bryant, I, th I know so many of you remember Tom, because he, he, I think, presided over our, our um, uh, these symposia until the year before last, and he passed away. But um, today Steve is still in the field. He is president and chief executive officer of the not-for-profit Shepherd Pratt Health System in Baltimore, Maryland. Maryland, where he's worked for 27 years. He's also a clinical professor and I left my last page. <laughs> You'll have to tell him what else you are, because I think I, <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> he's a clinical professor and vice president of something, Steve. You'll have to tell him, because I didn't bring my last page. <laughs> but that was all. That was my last sentence. Please help me welcome Steve. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And Vice President of what? Not important. <laughs> it's in your packet. <laughs> Thank you. I love you. I love you too. Okay, let's see. Okay, this is my talk. Mental health policy in America. Uh, the takeaway is who was who president or first lady matters. Uh, okay. Who is this? Anybody? Dorothea Dix. All right. Dorothea Dix. Dorothea Dix. Take you back to the 19th century to 1832. Uh, she was teaching Sunday school in the Cambridge City Jail. There was no... It was the dead of winter and there was no heat. And when she complained to the jailer about the lack of heat, he said to her, I quote, Madam, the insane require no heat, unquote. Now, that's of course where the mentally ill were and that's what they were called. They were called insane. They were in jails and almshouses, poor houses, attics, basements, uh, they were homeless. You might ask what else is new, but at the same time, this offended Dorothea Dix right down to her Christian core. And she decided that she was now going to devote her entire life to become a champion on behalf of the insane. And 1832 began a 40-year journey, odyssey, in which this woman, uh, on her own, obviously the most successful single citizen reformer in the history of this country, led to the establishment of some 32 asylums in 18 states. Asylums were not a bad word in those days. Humane, small institutions for the mentally ill. In the middle of her career, she petitioned the federal government for funds for the mentally ill. The uh, form of it was a land-grant sale it was called the 12,500,000 Acres Act that would have provided funds for federal asylums across the country. It was a four-year odyssey. She had got the bill passed in the House in 1848, got the bill passed in the Senate in 1850, and finally got both houses with the help of former President Millard Fillmore, 
uh, and uh, it was passed and, uh, in 1852. Uh, let me just quote from Dorothea Dix in her petition to the U.S. Congress. I confide to you the cause and claims of the destitute and of the desolate, who through the providence of God are wards of the nation, claimants on the sympathy and care of the public through the miseries and disqualifications brought upon them by the sorest afflictions with, with which humanity can be visited. This was the kind of language that she used not only in the Congress but in all the state legislatures as she went across the country being the advocate that she was. Now this legislation was vetoed. This is President Franklin Pierce. Let me quote from his veto message. I, have, I am compelled to dissent from the conclusion of the two houses of Congress. If Congress has the power to make provision for the indigent insane, the whole field of public beneficence would be thrown open to the care and culture of the federal government. I readily acknowledge the duty incumbent upon us all to provide for those who in the mysterious order of providence are subject to want and to disease of body or mind but I cannot find any authority in the Constitution that makes the federal government the great ominer of public charity throughout the United States. What a quote, the great ominer of public charity throughout the United States. To do so would be, in my judgment, contrary to the letter and the spirit of the Constitution, be prejudicial and beneficial to the noble offices of charity, unquote. This was the policy this veto message set the policy for the next hundred years. The federal government was not to be involved in the care of the mentally ill or the ill in general until this president, Dwight Eisenhower. Dwight Eisenhower was important because he signed Title II of the Social Security Act, the SSDI program. This act began the reversal of President Pierce's veto of 100 years before. It was almost exactly 100 years. He also established the Commission on Mental Health and Illness, the first major commission to study the situation of, uh, of, the, uh, of the mentally ill. That was a, a five-year effort. Uh, he was very involved in expanding the mission of the National Institute of Mental Health that had been established a few years before and was very concerned about the issue of mental illness because of his experience in World War II and how that changed views about the importance to the nation of acute mental illness. Action for Mental Health was published in 1961, and in 1963, John F. Kennedy signed the Mental Retardation Facilities and Community Mental Health Centers Act, uh, the bold new approach uh, we just, uh, uh, a, a number of us here just uh, celebrated that at the Kennedy Library two weeks ago, the signing of the Community Mental Health Centers Act. That began a, a radical different idea uh, that with federal leadership, the establishment of programs all across the country, the goal was to cover the country uh, with community mental health centers, with seed money from the federal government, uh, but that eventually they would be self-sustaining. Lyndon Johnson uh, is important, of course, for the major Social Security titles, uh, 18 uh, and uh, 19, uh, Medicare and Medicaid, uh, that have had the most influence in terms of opportunities for care and treatment uh, for the mentally ill. But it's important that he also championed the 1965 amendments that provided staffing funds for the community mental health centers and gave uh, the uh, energy to the appropriations for establishing mental health centers all across the country. It was, the, uh, it was really the Johnson years that led to covering about half the country with federally funded community mental health centers. That happened despite this man, Richard Nixon, who made a number of efforts to defund the community mental health centers program, resisted by Congress, which uh, renewed the program a number of times during the course of that, uh, during his presidency. Um, I became a public health officer at the NIMH in, in 1974, 1973, 1974, and uh, this was right before President Nixon resigned. 
and he had proposed a reorganization of uh, the NIMH, uh, which was again an effort to defund the Community Mental Health Centers program. And one of my first jobs was to carry in a brown envelope the plans of the administration down to the Congress, to Congressman Paul Rogers, uh, and uh, to uh, then um, um, uh, let the Congress have an oversight hearing as to what the plans were. And of course, it actually ne never happened. But at that point, again, the White House started an investigation. Who leaked those documents? It was a very young public health service officer that put them down. Now here we are, Jimmy Carter signing the Mental Health Systems Act of 1980, with Rosalind smiling in the background, and also a smiling Ted Kennedy, who had been running against uh, Jimmy Carter for uh, the uh, 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 for president. Uh, uh, but he was very supportive of um, the Mental Health Systems Act. Uh, Mental Health Systems Act of 1980, Public Law 96-398. I guess, um, here's Jimmy, President Carter, Mrs. Carter from those days. Ah! <laughs> this is the fellow you fell in love with, Rosalind. <laughs> and, in 1980. I, I had a very bad case of Potomac fever. Um, I was going back to the Senate and the House. I was testifying. I had all kinds of uh, uh, interesting experiences. And I'll just digress for a minute and just tell you about one. This was an oversight hearing. Uh, it took place in, the, uh, in 1980. Uh, and um, uh, I, I, I was asked recently, uh, with the government shutdown, why weren't there mental health professionals help, trying to help the Congress uh, deal with this problem? And immediately I, I had a, a recollection that while I was testifying, a uh, gentleman, a uh, Republican from California, with very far right views, who would be very comfortable with the Tea Party, uh, and started to ask me the following questions. His name was William Dannemeyer. Mr. Dannemeyer, you are a psychiatrist, are you not? Dr. Sharfstein, warily, yes. I have, to, I have to set the scene. You're sitting down, and the committee is sitting up, and you're alone, and behind you are about 150 people, including all the advocates. Is not, this is Mr. Dannemeyer, is not one of the elements of mental illness the failure of the person to be in touch with reality? Dr. Sharfstein, uh, yes. Mr. Dannemeyer, so, sir, how would you assess a Congress which year after year exhibits an addiction to spending more money than it takes in, in the way of taxes? How would you describe it in the terms of your perspective as a psychiatrist and in terms of mental illness? <laughs> I said to myself, ah, this is my chance to be front page Washington Post. Shrink calls Congress bonkers. <laughs> but then I said, and I quote, Sir, I feel as a psychiatrist I'm competent to diagnose patients, but in terms of a group process such as the Congress would be to venture an opinion that would absolutely exceed my competence. <laughs> there were boos in the background, people booing. <laughs> it, was, it was terrible. Well, I, you know, eventually I did get over my Potomac fever, and I'll tell you about that uh, in a few minutes. So Ronald Reagan came into office, and he put the Mental Health Systems Act on the shelf, essentially repealing it. And it's a very interesting question to ask the question, what would have happened if Mitt Romney had won? What would he have done with the Affordable Care Act? He would have probably done the same thing, or made every effort to repeal it. And it does really matter, uh, you know, elections matter. And um, I, I have wondered over the years how much uh, uh, time we've lost, how much opportunity we've lost to provide a quality care and treatment for those with mental illness because of the repeal of the Mental Health Systems Act. It was put into a block grant. And, uh, uh, and so um, uh, Ronald Reagan morphed into Franklin Pierce. That's pretty cool, isn't it? 
Franklin Pierce is absolutely the intellectual progenitor of uh, Ronald Reagan and his views about the role of the federal government. Uh, and so, th and this battle continues today. This is one of the big battles today in this country as, is, as reflected in Washington, but all across the country, is what is the appropriate role of government and what is the appropriate role of federal government. President Clinton, um, was very, absolutely essential in bringing, in bringing the issue of parity forward. And in 1996 was the first parity bill, and he brought parity to federal employees. And during that time period, the Surgeon General's report came out, which was a very strong uh, statement after the President's Commission on Mental Health in 1980, uh, reinforcing the public health needs uh, that, need, that had to be addressed by the federal government and by all uh, areas of our society. And then, uh, this is um, uh, George Bush uh, uh, with the signing of the 2008 Parity Bill. But as you know, uh, the new Freedom Commission on Mental Health uh, happened during his presidency. Uh, very clearly, mental health is a bipartisan issue, and uh, it is important that uh, we recognize that. And then finally, this is President Obama signing the Affordable Care Act, 2010. Now, we'll hear about that over the next uh, day and a half, and um, we'll hear about uh, the, uh, uh, the aspects of parity uh, and the Affordable Care Act from Secretary Sebelius tomorrow. But I thought I would spend um, my time comparing the Mental Health Systems Act of 1980 and the Affordable Care Act. Now, the Mental Health Systems Act was bipartisan. There was, there was absolutely strong uh, Republican support. Uh, you will remember, Mrs. Carter, that the ranking Republican in the House was Tim Lee Carter. He had the, that name, but he was very right wing. Uh, he was a physician, a primary care physician, and recognized the need for, uh, for uh, mental health services. And the bill was bipartisan, but that, that, that did not insulate it from, from the repeal that occurred in 1981. One area of absolute comparison is the role of federal government. Uh, the Mental Health Systems Act would have expanded greatly the role of the National Institute of Mental Health uh, and, uh, and the Public Health Service in the provision of care uh, throughout the United States. Uh, it was gonna be still a federal leadership with a partnership with states and private entities uh, to expand uh, opportunities for care, promote quality, and contain costs. But there would have been significant federal dollars, much more significant than what happened in terms of the block grants to the states. But there were other aspects of the act uh, that uh, probably forgotten today that, that echo with the Affordable Care Act uh, in 2010. The, both uh, bills emphasize the need for integration of care, of mental illness treatment and care, and primary care and general health services. In fact, in the Mental Health Systems Act, there was a title having to do with integration of mental health services with primary care and uh, health care in general. And that would, there would have been funds that would have provided uh, opportunities for uh, nurses and primary care physicians and mental health professionals to work together collaboratively in community mental health centers, community health centers you know, across the country. There was a uh, theme in, uh, in the Mental Health Systems Act that's echoed very much in the Affordable Care Act of underserved and high priority groups such as the severely and persistently mentally ill who would have been in state hospitals in a prior era that now live in the community. The homeless, um, the, uh, there were separate titles in the Mental Health Systems Act on children and prevention. But there was also a title in the Mental Health Systems Act on innovation, innovation grants. It's a big part of the Affordable Care Act. There would have been funds to, that uh, would have uh, granted uh, uh, monies for innovative projects uh, such as the um, uh, uh, integration of substance use and mental, uh, mental health services, the close interaction between poverty, work, and mental health. Uh, there would have been grants for peer support and interventions. We would have been way ahead in 2013 uh, if, in fact, the innovation grants of the Mental Health Systems Act were funded. Now, the Affordable Care Act has its innovation grants. These are going to be very important in the whole effort to not only expand access to care, but also uh, 
so expand quality of care and costs and contain costs. Both acts had at heart a public health perspective, a population focus. The original Community Mental Health Centers Act contained that with the notion of catchment areas where these centers had, were responsible for a geographic area and for all the mental health needs in that particular area. There's a wish to try to do our best to bring together various streams of funding and a public-private partnership. They were all in the Mental Health Systems Act and they are in the Affordable Care Act. Now, as, we, as uh, Mrs. Carter said, it, we, it remains to be seen whether we're going to see full implementation of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, there are many obstacles to overcome, not the least of which is uh, uh, you, the, uh, uh, the problems with the web. Uh, but the, one of the main questions uh, that certainly is going to have to be addressed is whether there will be enough specialized services out there, whether within the uh, integrated uh, uh, medical care system or, or in the se separate specialty system for the large numbers of people who will be uh, need care and will benefit from uh, having access to either Medicaid uh, or uh, the insurance exchanges. So advocacy matters, and it's going to matter in the next few years to accomplish the major goals of both the Mental Health Systems Act and the Affordable Care Act. Now, I left government shortly after um, the election of 1980. In fact, I, uh, when, I, uh, when I left, I was called by um, uh, one of the health reporters in, in Washington and said, Steve, are you the first head to roll? And I said, no, this was something that I wanted to do. I wanted to get, uh, get back to clinical psychiatry. I worked at the NIH. I eventually ended up at Shepherd Pratt, where I've been for most of the last 30 years, trying to actualize in my garden in Baltimore, but also throughout the state of Maryland, that's our catchment area, a vision of a public-private partnership, a hospital without walls, uh, community-based care uh, across the state of Maryland. Um, a continuum of care, very much inspired uh, by the Mental Health Systems Act of 1980. Those are my comments. Um, I hope uh, I provided something of a historical context for what you uh, are going to be dealing with in the next uh, few days. Um, I think uh, uh, it's a... Uh, continuing interesting struggle. Uh, it was gonna, it's going to play out in all levels of government and it's going to play out in community after community. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sharfstein. What a walk through uh, our history as a field. Um, I had the distinct pleasure earlier in my career to actually serving in one of those hospitals that Dorothea Dix um, uh, inspired in Washington, D.C., St. Elizabeth's Hospital. For those of you who had been in Washington, know that historic um, facility was also inspired by uh, Dorothea Dix. What an uh, interesting walk through the past. Thank you, Steve. Uh, now we're going to move on uh, to our first panel. Uh, I'm going to introduce the uh, moderator of that panel, and then we'll bring them up and, and get to work. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, excuse me. Joel's going to do it. I'm going to introduce Joel. <laughs> My apologies. Uh, Joel Miller has over 30 years experience in healthcare, behavioral policy, and has advocated for the creation of the federal and state policy and regulatory solutions to improve the delivery and financing of healthcare and behavioral healthcare in the U.S. In his current role as Executive Director and CEO of the American Mental Health Counselors Association, headquartered in Alexandria, Virginia, Mr. Miller leads over 7,000 clinical mental health counselors who have a critically important impact on the lives of Americans with behavioral health conditions. The AMHCA's mission is to enhance the mental health counseling profession through advocacy, professional development, and education. Mr. Miller is responsible for all operations of the organization and implementing strategic initiatives in support of the board of directors. He also serves as a member of the AMHCA Foundation Board of Directors. He has published over 50 articles and reports on behavioral health 
in healthcare delivery and financing healthcare reform. And Joel was also part of planning this entire symposium. Joel, welcome. Well, I guess that's the first false start of the meeting. But good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. It's uh, obviously a tough act to follow. Uh, Mrs. Carter, uh, Steve Sharfstein, who's a you know a real giant in the mental health community. But I didn't realize that I was also going to have to follow Franklin Pierce, Dwight, he Dwight Eisenhower, Ronald Reagan, President Carter, Bill Clinton, and so on. And I wish we can go back to that last picture because I must be doing something very wrong because if you notice on that last picture there that I've been with the American Mental Health Counselors Association for the last three months and putting in a lot of time. I really haven't gotten outside much, haven't played golf or tennis. And I'm wondering that this picture was taken on March 20th in the middle basically of winter in Washington and everybody's got this great suntan. You know, and I thought they were working the votes, you know, for the last couple of months. I, I don't get it why they all look so great, and I haven't been outside in three months, but they must be doing something right, namely, you know, some kind of balance in, in their work lives. But anyway, uh, you know, when I was asked to take this, you know, setting the stage kind of presentation, uh, you know, I was a little bit worried following, you know, the, the folks that I just mentioned. And when I uh, was on a recent plane trip, there was this, you know, usual airplane guide, you know, with all those silly articles, and I was thumbing through it, and it looked like it had been handled by about 30 other people and probably belonged in a toxic waste dump. But I saw this article which talked about the listening patterns of audiences, because I was very worried that, you know, would, would I have your, your attention throughout this entire presentation? And in this article, and I should mention it's a non-peer-reviewed article, I found the following information, that only about 10% of any given audience is actually listening to the speaker. The other 15% is thinking about their golf game or tennis game, doing the laundry or catching the next flight. And the other 75% are engaged in a sexual fantasy. Now, I thought about that for a while, and I realized that no matter what I say here today, three quarters of you are going to leave here having had a great time. <laughs> now, in my framing talk, I'm going to try to zero in on some major opportunities that I see relative to the impact of the Affordable Care Act in addressing the needs of uninsured individuals with mental illness. And I've kind of broken this out into four major blocks of activity expanding health insurance coverage, increasing access to services, redesigning the system, and quality improvement. And I'm also going to try to spend a few moments to really kind of set the stage for the following panels and, work, and the workshop sessions related to Medicaid expansion, some of the problems we're seeing there in states not participating in that expansion, maximizing enrollment in the Affordable Care Act as well as the essential health benefits package and how that addresses the needs of people uh, with mental illness. You know, I, I believe very strongly that the, the Affordable Care Act really does usher in a, a golden age for coverage of behavioral health services, as well as introducing several system reforms I'm going to speak about in detail. And as our program highlighted, the passage of health care reform really was a milestone in the long-standing effort to ensure access to, for all Americans to appropriate, high-quality behavioral health care, as well as prevention and treatment services. And many of the prominent features of the Affordable Care Act are really instrumental in establishing the centrality, a real core of behavioral health services within the overall health care delivery system. We have been fighting for this as Steve said, for three decades or, or longer, going all the way back to Franklin Pierce. And, you know, expanding Medicaid eligibility, you know, and the health insurance marketplaces really creates a new way for lower income uninsured people to obtain health insurance. But it also makes a number of changes 
on how mental health is delivered here in the United States. So in, in several of the books you know, that Mrs. Carter has wrote and you know, many of the articles that we've seen over the years about the continuation with all the progress that we've made you know, in terms of you know, parity, uh, introducing integrated care delivery systems, essential health benefit package, you know, what better way to dramatically reduce stigma, discrimination, outright rejection that people keep, that keep people from seeking timely needed help and services than opening up this massive coverage door that we're about to witness with the Affordable Care Act and that it's treated like any other illness. So what I'm going to talk about today are some of those several you know, transformative impacts that I had on my outline slide and really zeroing in initially on coverage expansions. And you know, the, first, the first slide uh, that I really wanted to you know, kind of give you a view is this kind of waterfall cascading effect uh, that, that I believe will have this ultimate positive impact on uninsured people with mental illness. And those four blocks of activity or four waves of activity are coverage integration, uh, access service infrastructure issues, delivery integration, and last but not least, quality improvement. And as you can see, there are like these individual blocks of activity uh, within you know, these four kind of uh, imperatives you know, that, that lead us to people getting high quality, affordable health care and health insurance. Uh, and expanding health insurance coverage, and I really tried to highlight that, I think is the real key to the overall ball game. I'm going to go into that in a little bit more details, but the dots are connected. I mean, not only do we have to expand coverage, but we have to increase mental health and health care benefits and provide those benefits at parity. And a key thing to keep in mind is that you can't have an essential health benefits package, you know, at parity with medical and, uh, and surgical benefits without getting coverage. The access service infrastructure, I think, as Steve said, is maybe the trickiest or the most challenging because we're going to have to find some really interesting ways and unique ways on how we deploy the mental health or behavioral health workforce in order to get the job done when we're going to have this influx of newly insured people coming into the system. Uh, and at the same time, how we're going to address the needs of people you know, who have been really outside the system, minority populations who have not had the ability to pay, the ability to access services, and how that dovetails you know, with deploying the mental health workforce in, in rural areas and in inner cities and across the United States in a lot of pockets where simply the mental health, for, health workforce does not exist. And part of that equation is collaborating across providers and government agencies. And I think we're going to have to learn how to live in a new, very dynamic managed care marketplace because I think that's where we're headed uh, within the Affordable Care Act and if you just look at the overall healthcare environment. There's four major activities that I've identified under this delivery integration imperative. If you talk to folks in Health and Human Services, the Centers for Medicare, Medicaid Services, and so on in the federal government, there, those individual discussions point out to one thing, I believe, and that's how do we do a better job of redesigning or reinventing the mental health system. Uh, you know, over the years, there's been a lot of waiver programs, demonstration projects, and grants, but how do we, how do we kind of push all of those things that we've learned, lessons learned and best practices, in developing a better way for delivering and integrating care? And, and as part of that equation, is promoting prevention and early screening and early, and early intervention, and especially trying to get folks the right care at the right time, uh, as well as integrating mental health and primary care services. And what I'm afraid has also gotten maybe lost in the shuffle is under the Affordable Care Act, I think it drives more coordination between mental health and substance abuse services. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about each of these in a little detail uh, to kind of set the stage you know, for our discussions this afternoon and tomorrow by leading off on coverage expansion. And I think just by 
the coverage expansion provisions in the Affordable Care Act, it's transformative by its very nature for people with mental health conditions. Because health insurance coverage, no matter how you look at the system overall, is the pass key to the delivery system and to quality care. It's what we're looking for for people with mental health conditions. It's stable, solid, consistent, affordable, sleep better at, your, at night security and protection for you and your loved ones. And the Affordable Care Act tries to address all of those issues because we don't want to see more people go into the emergency room. We don't want to see more people ending up in jails. We don't want to see more people out on the streets. And if more people had stable health insurance coverage and a primary care doc, we wouldn't be seeing these kinds of problems. So again, I'm going to keep harking back that the core is getting people covered. And the good news is, looking at data that was developed by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA, nationally about 6.6 .6 million people, you know, adults specifically, with a mental illness, are eligible for coverage in the new state Medicaid expansion program out of about 20 million people who are projected overall to be newly insured if the Affordable Care Act is implemented properly. And this is just between this five-year period between 2014 and 2019. And the good news is the federal government, the first three years under this program, are going to pay 100% of all those costs, and it'll gradually taper off to 90% by the year 2020 and remain there. And the funds have been set aside to pay for this coverage expansion, which also gets lost in the shuffle. This is not going to be tax increases on middle-income people in the years 2015, 2016. The revenues are already there. And what's funny about this, and maybe even ironic, is that those funds have come through various revenue sources. Number one, the hospital industry agreed to cutbacks in reimbursement over a 10-year period, knowing they were going to get a lot of new customers coming into their hospitals, and they were going to be circulating through the emergency rooms and incurring a lot of charity care and bad debt. Also, other providers are getting hit with taxes, insurance companies, nursing homes, uh, device manufacturers, pharmaceutical companies. All these monies are going in to one big pot to pay for this coverage expansion. So I want to make it very clear that this isn't something that we're dealing with funny money. The funds are there. It's only a matter of the will to make sure we implement this law properly. And on top of this major coverage expansion, relative to, you know, to the Medicaid program, another 6.6 .6 another 6.8 million uninsured adults with a mental illness could also gain health insurance coverage through the implementation of the state health insurance exchanges under the Affordable Care Act. And again, eligible people here will receive tax credits and subsidies to help pay for those premium costs. And again, the funds have been set, have been set aside and, and all of this is documented by the Congressional Budget Office. The CBO is the official scorekeeper of, you know, any new law, any new bill. It has to be scored to determine how much it costs. Not only have they said that the costs are there to pay for all these coverage expansions, but there will be $100 billion left over to pay towards reducing the federal budget deficit. So if you want to look all this up on, on the Congressional Budget Office website, it's there in bright lights. Now specifically on the new Medicaid expansion, out of those 6.6 .6 million people, uh, who, uh, adults who are uninsured currently and eligible for the Medicaid expansion, who have incomes below 138% of the federal poverty level, about $16,000 a year. If you look at this bar chart, and at the very bottom of that first bar where it says 7%, about 1.3 million people, just people with serious mental illness who are currently uninsured are eligible under the new Medicaid expansion when you take in all 50 states. In the next bar at the bottom, another 2.7 million people in serious psychological distress, panic disorders, anxiety disorders, several mood disorders, are also eligible under the Medicaid expansion. And the third column, about 2.6 million 
people, uninsured adults with a substance abuse disorder are also eligible for coverage under the new Medicaid expansion. For a grand total of about 6.6 .6 million people who with a behavioral health condition who are eligible under the new Medicaid expansion program if all 50 states implement the program, and I'm gonna get into that a little bit later. Now on top of that new Medicaid expansion that I had mentioned in, the, in my previous slide, there are several, there are millions of people who are also gonna be eligible with a behavioral health condition who are currently uninsured and eligible for coverage under the new state health insurance marketplaces. And again, pretty similar numbers that we saw under the Medicaid expansion. About 1.2 million people, as you see on that first bar, are eligible with a serious mental illness who are eligible under the, under the state exchanges. Another 2.6 million in serious psych psychological distress. And almost 3 million people with a substance use disorder who are currently uninsured will be eligible for coverage through these new state health insurance exchanges for about a grand total of about 6.7, 6.8 million people for a grand total of about 13.5 million people who are currently uninsured with a behavioral health condition who are eligible for coverage either under the expansion, the new Medicaid expansion, or under the new state health insurance exchanges. So if there was any point I wanted to make in this talk is that health insurance coverage is really at the fingertips of all of these folks who are out there with no coverage, no Medicare currently, no Medicaid, no commercial insurance, no Blue Cross insurance, and it would really be a crying shame if this law is not implemented properly or if we have states not participating in these expansions. And on top of that, we have these very basic health insurance reforms embodied in the Affordable Care Act that are really going to address the needs of people with mental health conditions. First of all, all pre-existing condition limitations uh, are no longer you know, in place. All pre-existing condition limitations are being eliminated through the Affordable Care Act. It already happened with children in 2010. It's going to apply to adults beginning January 1st, 2014. And we know how tough it is to get health insurance if you have any kind of condition, chronic or otherwise. And insurers cannot charge people with poor health more than others, and no health plan can have a lifetime or annual limit on certain benefits or, rec or rescind coverage right in the middle of, of your insurance policy. And as I think many of you know, young adults can remain on their parents' policies up until age 26. So again, not only do we have these basic coverage expansions you know, embodied in the law, but you have these very fundamental health insurance reforms, which again would really be a shame if these disappeared because the law was either defunded or repealed. And also, as Steve said, the, the law also in, it incorporates major uh, you know, benefits as part of what's called an essential health benefits package, where qualified health plans in the insurance exchanges must offer, they must offer all 10 of these benefits in order to provide health insurance coverage on the exchanges. And I'm prominently, I wanted to highlight that mental health and substance use disorder services, including behavioral health treatments, are, have to be part of those packages offered you know, by insurance companies. But the beauty of this is, just, is not only that we've been fighting for years to make sure that these kinds of benefits are embedded in health insurance packages, but all these other goodies are part of it. Prevention, ambulatory, outpatient care, acute services, emergency room hospitalization, prescription drugs, and so on. Because it's, it, you've, you've seen the studies, the, pre you know, the, mor the mortality, the morbidity numbers for people with serious mental illness and other conditions are atrocious. People dying 25 years prematurely, depending on what study you look at. Not only do we have this core of mental health benefits, but now people who are experiencing other morbid conditions, other problems like asthma, diabetes, congestive heart failure, they'll have, benef they'll have these benefits in place so you treat the whole person. And the good news is, is that under this law, there's so much emphasis on prevention and wellness in the Affordable Care Act that, again, this would be another reason if the law disappeared, all this other stuff would disappear, namely these key preventative measures that are embodied in the law 
that come through the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force where they've included, for example, for adults, alcohol misuse screening, depression screening for children, uh, the same thing, behavioral assessments and depression screening. All of those are gonna be paid for and without any co-pays or co-insurance, no cost sharing, no out-of-pocket costs. Again, these are all embodied in the law and are incredibly important, again, with all the emphasis of trying to get early screening, early care to people who are experiencing symptoms, the Affordable Care Act, again, comes through in the clutch with these you know, various benefits. And again, as I mentioned, assuring mental health benefits at parity is also part of the law. Steve highlighted that, but keep this in mind, that again, you can't give an essential health benefits package at parity unless you have, you have health insurance coverage. These are just some of the numbers that have come out of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services where people currently have a health insurance through individual policies. They will see increased expansion of parity, namely 5 million Americans will gain substance abuse coverage parity. Nearly 2.5 million people who currently have individual coverage will gain mental health parity. And so overall, over 7 million Americans alone who have coverage in the current individual market which is pretty dysfunctional to begin with, will gain behavioral health parity through these insurance reforms. Now, let's move on to the access part of the imperative, this, the second kind of leg or wave as part of this waterfall effect. And this is probably going to be the most challenging, maybe the trickiest part of making this law effective, namely, how do we do a good job of deploying and positioning the mental health workforce? And I'm reminded by some recent presentations and articles where Joe Parks, who's gonna be speaking later, has talked about that all the folks who are gonna be retiring or aging out of the system, quote unquote, and that we are really gonna to have to really knuckle down and try to figure out how are we going to address the needs of people, uninsured people who are gonna be coming into the system with a mental health condition unless we appropriately deploy and position the current workforce. Uh, so this is going to be a major challenge that I know we're going to be talking about throughout the next couple of days. Uh, but again, if we're going to really transform the process, I think we're going to need the entire workforce uh, working together. And uh, I think it would be a real shame if we're going to have any kind of food fight in the profession because I think if everything is, is implemented appropriately, there's going to be plenty of business to go around for every mental health practitioner. But one thing I think we have to keep in mind is this overall en environmental factor imperative that I've highlighted on this slide, because workforce shortages will likely be impacted by the environment. Not only are things kind of tough right now to see a specialist, but with a large number of veterans returning from overseas, you know, with a mental health condition, uh, the new state reentry initiatives to reduce, you know, prison populations and the increasing number of baby boomers which is already having an impact on the healthcare system and the mental health system, it's gonna make, our, make our, our job and that challenge even tougher. So keep those areas in mind as we look at workforce issues over the next couple of days. But you know, with behavioral health and healthcare you know, moving towards a more population-based public health model, model that really recognizes prevention and the primacy of long-term recovery, I've tried to identify some key strategies that uh, hopefully we can look at and, and think about over the next day and a half, namely promoting you know, cross-training of the workforce to enhance capabilities uh, to treat co-occurring disorders, fostering the expansion of the workforce to recruit a more diverse workforce, uh, disseminating and promoting the adoption of evidence-based practices and encouraging the development and dissemination of behavioral health core competencies within primary care sector because regardless, more people still see their primary care physicians for mental health conditions, but as we're gonna probably talk about over the next couple of days, maybe the primary care physician community is not quite ready for this influx of newly insured people. And again, we've heard a lot about disparities and we've seen the articles and it seems like there's a a conference or a forum every other day about you know, behavioral health disparities, but in a very important way, the ACA 
will address this, this disparities is really by expanding, you know, access to health insurance coverage to millions of people, you know, especially those who are unable to access services because they simply can't afford it. So again, I think there's another transformative aspect as several studies do show the lack of health insurance that, you know, that negatively affects uh, the quality of healthcare services. And again, you need that pass key you know, to the health insurance system. And the ACA does include several provisions that I tried to identify here that again, I hope can serve as a guide going forward over the next couple of days uh, relative to grants, demonstration projects to help reduce disparities you know, within the system. And the last area as part of this infrastructure discussion is, you know, collaborating across providers, you know, government agencies on network development, managed care, and payment approaches. And interest is very high among third-party payers about introducing, you know, the concept of value-based purchasing. And there's been, you know, a lot of criticism about managed care and related activities. Well. You know, most people on Medicaid right now are in managed care plans. It's really up to us to be at the table, you know, with our ideas, our strategies, thinking outside the box, how we work, you know, with the managed care industry and health plans, who are going to be offering, you know, these new qualified, you know, programs that include mental health benefits and all the other benefits that we highlighted. So it's going to be incumbent upon you all to really know Con contracting, you know, procedures, uh, when and how the insurance is looking to expand their networks, what types of folks they want as part of those networks to address different populations. And again, I think this is going to be another challenge, but a real key to the success of, of a widespread value-based purchasing imperative would be the adoption of quality measures, meaningful performance metrics, you know, the avoidance of health disparities and provision of re really incentives that's a win-win, not only for the, for the insurance industry, but for providers as well. I'm just going to talk briefly, because I think this is going to be covered in a lot of other presentations, is, that, you know, this, this integration delivery imperative. Uh, and again, as I mentioned earlier, the interest is incredibly high. Uh, among federal purchasers as well as the private sector on how we can redesign the mental health system with the knowledge that we have right now and the lessons we've learned. And the good news is in body, we've talked a lot about coverage, but there's really a whole slew of delivery reform provisions in the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and first, you know, the AC provide, you know, provisions really will enable states and federal agencies to to test all kinds of new delivery mechanisms like health homes already, accountable care organizations, as well as parallel you know, payment arrangements, whether it's bundling or capitation or prospective payment systems. Uh, and, and it also allows providers to maybe look at better ways to coordinate uh, you know, behavioral health services with social service programs. Uh, as well as things like supported employment, supported housing, transportation, education, the list is endless. The Affordable Care Act is going to spur that kind of discussion and that kind of overall macro integration. But specifically, I, w I do want to mention, going back to our discussion on prevention, that it is all about prevention right now. And the AC really brings prevention to the forefront. Uh, it builds on a lot of the recommendations of the Institute of Medicine report on preventing mental, emotional, and behavioral disorders among young people. It promotes the prevention and early identification of both health care and behavioral health problems, you know, really allowing then, you know, appropriate early intervention, which can reduce the burden of disease on children, on families and communities. And, and thanks to the coverage and solid benefits, children can really begin therapy, maybe even without a specific diagnosis. That can be, you know, sometimes very difficult to determine for young people. So we have a real prospective process here, you know, through these early prevention, prom health promotion activities to get to people early when they're experiencing initial symptoms. And again, the ACA really emphasizes this in full force. And in, in terms of integrating mental health care and primary care, 
we know there's still, this is still going to be a major challenge. I still feel we're still kind of on the starting blocks uh, in terms of looking at the best ways to integrate primary care and behavioral health services. And a lot of people still are not getting that kind of appropriate care, but I think the opportunities exist in the Affordable Care Act. And again, it's already happening with the implementation of health homes and accountable care organizations to try to drive that integration in a way but it addresses the needs of people with serious mental illness and other behavioral health conditions. And this ain't going to happen automatically. Uh, we, as I said, we're really at the starting blocks on this, and there's been a lot of good, good work done, but you know, a lot of barriers still exist uh, you know, throughout the provider community. Uh, health plans have been frustrated in how to develop these kinds of networks and integrated programs. Uh, and still looking at the numbers, less than 15% of, of the people with depression in primary care settings get adequate care based on several studies, peer-reviewed studies that have been released over the last few years. And again, I think what's gotten lost in the shuffle is the integration of substance abuse and mental health services. And again, the, the Affordable Care Act really encourages the use of preventive services and substance abuse education, evaluation, treatment problems, and enables, I think, really a new transformation in this area that I'm afraid has kind of fallen behind or gotten lost in the shuffle with the emphasis on more mental health services. And again, this is done through a more whole person, you know, whole enterprise perspective that again focuses on integration. So I think the opportunities are just endless here for greater collaboration and cooperation among behavioral health, primary care, and, and other, other providers to address the needs of people with substance abuse. Very quickly, I just wanted to mention here that I, there's gonna be a lot of pressure from, from third-party payers on using the best practices, evidence-based treatments, and support services. That's gonna come home in all of your discussions with third-party payers and purchasers but we know it can contribute you know, to a very high functioning and recovery that are often not used in the care of people suffering from mental illnesses. We really need to scale up big time you know, those evidence-based treatments that we know work for people. And the kinds of questions that third-party payers want to know is you know, what's the appropriate modality and setting that will work? You know, what does the evidence say? about certain populations and treatments for those populations, how much will these individual individuals need, and of course, what it costs. You can't get away from that part of the equation. And finally, what all of these things that we've been talking about lead into is making sure that, you know, if the Affordable Care Act is gonna work and those previous 11 imperatives and individual waves is making sure that care is person-centered and supports the overall health of individuals with mental illness. And a modern system really should include a structure that includes holistic outcomes and measures and indicators that everybody is looking at simultaneously. And a real key here is the development of interoperable, integrated you know, electronic health records. That's gonna be a necessary component. And I know there's concerns about privacy and confidentiality, but I think the train has already left the station and we should get on it and can, how we can manage that part of the process. So I think the potential is, is really there for this greatly expanded access you know, to treatments, but in a very person-centered, focused way. I've talked about a lot of these things you know, that are more upstream than downstream, but when it really gets down to it, I mean, the ultimate goal of all these reforms is that the client is receiving the right care at the right time, in the right setting, from the right providers, you know, who are delivering, you know, quality evidence-based mental health services. You know, that's really where we're at. You can talk about all of those waves and all of those components, but this is the bottom line, that all of those things, the re ultimate result is getting the right care at the right time you know, to folks with mental illness, many of them who have been outside the system for many years. Now, some of the challenges, uh, and I'm sure you've, you, you read the newspapers every day and it seems like there's an article on each one of these, these challenges. Uh, many states, 25 states at the moment, 
are currently opting out, not participating in the new Medicaid expansion program. And it, it, there's no mystery here. You know, the best way, I believe, strongly in most experts is that if you're going to reduce mental illness, you're going to reduce stigma and discrimination through better access to health insurance coverage and timely effective services, this is our opportunity. We need to eliminate access barriers, you know, from, because if you're going to really implement this law, all the states need to be on board implementing the Medicaid expansion program. And it's going to be paid for at 100% the first three years and nine out of every $10 basically going forward. You know, so the monies are there, uh, the need is there. And it could really help accelerate the creation of a very strong infrastructure for treating people with mental health you know, conditions. So expansion saves lives, it improves the quality of life, it improves the health and the, and the, and the health status of millions of people who are uninsured currently with mental illness. We need to be out there on the front lines talking to legislators and policymakers early next year when they're going to be reconsidering their positions on Medicaid expansion, that this is a critically important component for the success of the Affordable Care Act. And just look at the numbers on this particular slide uh, that really point up, uh, even from an economic point of view, forgetting about the coverage side of the equation, that the worst case scenario is that states are incurring about 45 to $50 million in uncompensated care costs, maybe all the way up to $85 billion in uncompensated costs between 2014 and 2019. If people receive health insurance coverage and getting care, they're not going to be in the emergency department. They're not going to get admitted, and the rest of us will be picking up their care if you have job-based health insurance coverage. So you really have a way here of looking at funds that, that's being expended by state agencies because you have all these new federal funds coming in. So it's a huge win for state economies and for state budgets. And it's in light of the fact that we've seen $5 billion on this, on this second graphic on the, you know, below the information on uncompensated care that the mental health system at the state level has taken an incredible hit. And here we have an opportunity to bring billions of dollars into the system to help people with mental illness, and you have 25 states that are opting out. And again, where the rubber meets the road, I'm not going to get into a long discussion because all of the officials in the Obama administration have said, you know, umpteen times that, yeah, the, the implementation of healthcare.gov you know, was pretty much a debacle, but that they said they're going to get it right, and hopefully they will get it right. Otherwise, I'm afraid the success of this law uh, could rapidly go, go south. So it's really important, but I think what's also important is at the state level that you all need to be working on outreach and enrollment to make sure that people with mental health conditions are enrolled in various systems, Medicaid expansion, uh, the, new, the new state health insurance exchanges, as well as a lot of people who are currently, who are eligible under the current Medicaid program, but for whatever reason, maybe it's misinformation or a lack of information, that are not enrolled in the current Medicaid program. And there's about another five or six million people out of that, on top of that 13.5 million that I mentioned earlier that are also eligible for coverage under the current Medicaid expansion program. So it's going to be important for you all to get out there and urge state officials to really take maximum advantage of the opportunity to get those new monies in, not only for coverage purposes, but to help modernize the systems. And there's been a lot of talk about bringing young people into the system. The Obama administration has estimated that about 2.7 million people between the ages of 19 and 29 need to enroll if the Affordable Care Act is really going to work because you need to have young, healthy people in a group health insurance process along with sick or older adults to help kind of spread out those costs. So again, when you're talking about enrollment and outreach, it's going to be very important to have young people enrolling in the process uh, to make the insurance marketplace work appropriately. And again, there's coalitions, there's alliances, all kinds of activities happening in each state 
make sure you're at, the, at that table, and if not, you should be convening a coalition to make sure that uh, the proper job of enrolling, of, of outreach, enrollment, and eligibility is happening, and with a really special emphasis on identifying key segments of the population you know, to target who may be outside the system and may be hard to get to and information about their, either their coverage rights under the Affordable Care Act. My view, pretty simple, is this, that the Affordable Care Act health care reform is mental health reform. If anybody's got a better way of addressing the needs of people with mental illness, I'm all ears. But in going through all of those provisions, I can't think of a better way right now, beginning in 2014, to make a major leap on how we address the needs of, mental, uh, the needs of people with mental health conditions who have had no health insurance coverage for years. So I hope during you know, the remainder of the symposium that you really roll up your sleeves. There's going to be several opportunities in the breakout sessions uh, that are, I think, organized by region to identify new opportunities, new strategies for implementing a lot of the provisions that we've discussed, that highlighted here so far, and to help kind of foster kind of this cross-state or transfer information knowledge exchange over the next two days, you know, around operational strategies to address enrollment, you know, outreach, as well as connecting, you know, essential health benefit package information to the overall coverage issues. So I think it's going to be a, a wonderful opportunity over the next two days to really kind of think about how we can address the needs of people with mental illness. So I really appreciate the, the invitation, the opportunity. Uh, thank you very much, Mrs. Carter, Tom, John Bartlett, and all the members of the Planning Committee on this opportunity to kind of set the stage here. Uh, so thanks again, and I'll be glad to answer any questions throughout the conference. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Joel. A uh, lot of uh, food for thought. Uh, at this point, we're scheduled to take a 15-minute break and uh, welcome you all to go out and enjoy some uh, uh, refreshments, and we will reconvene in 15 minutes. Thank you all.